Assalamu alaikum friends welcome to part 2 of IFRS 3 this video I'll be focusing on all the things needed for your group accounting we'll be calculating NCI goodwill the net as fair value of net assets fair value of consideration all those things we are going to cover in this video very important for your question number one without this knowledge you cannot even do your question number one in SBR which is for 30 marks okay so in the last part I have stopped with the what is business what constitutes a business what is an asset you have to do an optional concentration test then we went through more detailed analysis for example we went through the import and the processes then we uh, went through the who how to identify who is the acquirer and the acquisition date and now we are going to cover from there onwards identifiable assets and liabilities okay you must measure this at fair value all the assets and liabilities at the accusation date okay what does IFR, IFRS 3 says about asset that is identifiable how do you tell that asset is identifiable or not asset is identifiable if it is capable of disposal separately from the business owning it you can sell it separately it is known as an asset identifiable asset okay or it arises from contractual or other legal rights regardless of whether those rights can be sold separately or not it does not matter but it arises from contractual or legal right that asset next the identifiable assets and liabilities of the subsidy should be recognized at the fair value okay assets and liabilities of the fair value of the subsidiary should be recognized at fair value according according to IFRS 3 okay where they meet the definition of assets and liabilities where they meet the definition of assets and liabilities in the 2010 conceptual framework okay remember that for the the IFRS a specific IFRS the standard it is not updated the definition of assets and liabilities only the conceptual framework is updated to 2018 that's why you can see here that they are referring to 2010 conceptual framework for the definition of assets and liabilities okay well, this is not so very important. What you have to know is assets and liabilities at fair value of the subsidiary. They are exchanged as a part of the business combination rather than a separate transaction. Okay, so that assets and liabilities, okay, where the exchange as a part of a business combination. Business combination means when you are acquiring a subsidiary, you are acquiring an entity, whatever the assets and liabilities you get from that business combination that you have to calculate at fair value not as a separate transaction as a separate transaction means you are just buying an asset and a liability for your own for your business let's say you bought an asset that will not be taken as uh, for that you cannot use IFRS 3 rule IFRS 3 rule for assets and liabilities can only be used when it comes in a, as a business combination for example when you have acquired a subsidiary and when you are taking over their assets and liabilities and consolidating in your financial statements you have to use fair value for those assets and liabilities okay next i told you ifrs 3s they are not updated to 80, 2018 conceptual frameworks uh, definition of assets and liabilities okay they still follow 2008 conceptual framework of assets and liabilities only that's why the difference is there so according to that 2010 what is the definition of an asset and liability assets means resources that are controlled by an entity from past event that is expected to lead to an inflow of economic benefit liability present obligation from past event that are expected to lead to an outflow of economic resources these things are not so very important when it comes to group accounting and all okay they will not ask you what is the assets and liabilities definition according to 2010 but if you see this with 2018 you will see that there's a difference okay that's the that's why i only i took you uh, through this definition the older definition just to show you that there's a difference that's it otherwise you are you, you don't need this okay items that are not identifiable or do not meet the definition of an asset or a liability are subsumed into the calculation of purchase goodwill if they are neither asset nor liability they are taken as goodwill okay that means you have purchased goodwill when you're calculating it watch out for the following terms this following terms are very important when it comes to group accounting 
What is it? Contingent liabilities, provisions, intangible assets, goodwill. Let us go to contingent liabilities. Contingent liabilities are recognized at fair value. All this, whatever we are talking, contingent liabilities, provision, intangible asset, we have separate standards for it, right? We are not talking about it now. We are talking this from the point of group accounting. When it's a consolidation, when it's a subsidiary, how are we valuing it from that perspective, okay? So, contingent liability, IS 37, right? We recognize, we do not recognize, we disclose. That's not important when it comes to group accounting. Group accounting, we recognize it, recognize it at fair value at the accusation date if there is a contingent liability okay so remember that this is true even when the economic outflow is not probable the fair value will incorporate the probability of an economic outflow you have to use that fair value they will give you the fair value if they have determined okay provisions provisions for future operating losses cannot be created as this is a post accusation item that means after the accusation. So you cannot make a provision for future operating losses. Even under IS 37, it is not uh, acceptable. What about the restructuring cost? This restructuring cost, we are talking from the terms of group, group accounting, okay? Restructuring costs are only recognized to the extent that the liability actually exists at the date of accusation. Remember, restructuring cost, we have a whole IS 37, in fact, the provision, okay? talks about restructuring cost but we are not going into detail here when it comes to group accounting in group accounting we have to see that whether it exists whether the liability actually exists at the date of accusation or not then only you have to recognize restructuring cost otherwise you cannot recognize restructuring cost okay they are only recognized to that extent only what about intangible assets Intangible assets are also recognized at fair value. So, good thing about IFRS 3 is everything is recognized at fair value. That makes it very easy that no one has to remember about different measurements. You know, intangible assets, fair value, goodwill, fair value, con consideration, fair value, NCI, fair value, everything is fair value. Okay. Intangible assets are recognized at fair value if they are separable or arise from legal or contractual rights. What does this mean? This might mean that the parent recognizes an intangible assets in the consolidated financial statements that the subsidiary did not recognize in its individual financial statements. For example, an internally generated brand name. Okay. What does it mean? See, internally generated for the subsidiary when they are generating this brand name they will not recognize it you don't recognize internally generated intangible assets in your financial statements right but when you consolidate the parent is buying that brand that intangible asset from the subsidiary so when you are buying an intangible assets on that that has to be calculated at fair value but something which the parent has internally generated that you cannot uh, uh, that you are not going to recognize it. You are only going to recognize intangible assets which you have bought from the subsidiary at fair value. Everything here, whatever you are recognizing it as at fair value, that you are buying it from the subsidiary. What about goodwill? Goodwill in the subsidiary's individual financial statement is not consolidated. Okay. This is because it is not separable. You cannot separate the goodwill. It's hard to separate goodwill. And it does not arise from legal or contractual rights also. Okay, so in the subsidiary's individual financial statements, you do not consolidate goodwill. Remember this. It's not always good to know one side. It's better to know both the side. What I mean to say is, we know that we have to make consolidated accounts, group accounting. So we are always focused on that. But you always have to know the impact on the individual financial statements also. What could be the impact? Whether it will be recognized or whether it will not be recognized. Because a question. Let's suppose if they ask a question, what is the impact on the individual financial statements? And you go and write about group accounting that you have to consolidate, you have to write goodwill. Total waste of time. And also marks also you are losing, not getting marks. So make sure that individual financial statements impact also you learn it. Right? This also you can be asked in group accounting. So in individual financial statements, you are not consolidating the goodwill. Okay? There are some exceptions. 
to measure the subsidies net assets net assets means both assets and liabilities at fair value what are those exceptions that means exceptions means you don't have to measure this net assets of subsidy at fair value there are some exceptions when accounting for business combination that means when you have bought bought a subsidiary what are those exceptions assets and liabilities falling within the scope of the following standard should be valued according to those standards so you have to see if anything falls in this four standards it will be valued according to this standard not fair value if it's an income tax for example income tax income tax asset income tax liability right if it's an income tax asset according to is 2 if it is an income tax a liability sorry not income tax deferred tax deferred tax asset deferred tax liability if it's a deferred tax asset according to is 12 if it's a deferred tax liability according to is 12 there you are not going to measure at fair value even if that income tax that deferred tax asset or deferred tax liability you have taken it from the subsidiary when you are acquiring the subsidiary still is 12 rule you have to use you are not going to value it value it at fair value same for employee benefits make sure that you remember this exceptions also while you are studying okay exceptions because what happens you you might go there and start valuing at fair value for this four standards which you should avoid okay employee benefit for example pension we have a defined benefit asset or a defined benefit liability both has to be measured under is 19 not fair value ifrs 2 share based payment again not at fair value according to ifrs 2 standard IFRS 5 again according to IFRS 5 rule not at fair value okay so just look out for the standards if you have them in your definitely you will have one of it right that you understanding i will be covering at the end after i finish this whole thing now let us go to the goodwill because these are very few very important things net asset is over okay now three things are left goodwill purchase consideration and your nci non controlling interest so goodwill you have to recognize goodwill on business combination whenever you are acquiring a subsidiary you have to recognize goodwill okay and how do you calculate goodwill it is the difference between the fair value of the consideration transfer that means how much you had to pay to buy that entity plus the nci you are adding the nci at the acquisition date and minusing the fair value of net assets acquires acquires means the subsidiary net assets so that is the formula to calculate goodwill remember it memorize it and keep next we are moving to purchase consideration very important purchase consideration itself is a topic because not every time we pay in cash sometimes we might pay in shares sometimes we might pay in contingent consideration that means based on some condition we will be paying it so it de depends okay so when you are calculating goodwill we need this purchase consideration to be accurate okay purchase consideration we already need to when we are, when we are calculating goodwill that is the only place we need this purchase consideration and that has to be correct otherwise your goodwill will be wrong so purchase consideration transferred to acquire the control of subsidy must be measured at fair value right they will give you the fair value normally that this is the fair value of the purchase consideration is at this much but if they give something beyond this for example this things which is listed below then the way you measure it will be different right sometimes you might not be given so simple they might give you in a uh, complex way then you should know how to deal with it so when determining the fair value of the consideration transferred if it's a contingent consideration how are you going to measure this contingent consideration is included even if the payment is not deemed probable even if it's you are very sure that the payment is not going to happen still you are including this in your consideration you have to include it it is included even if the probability is not there of the payment so its fair value will incorporate the probability of payment occurring okay so its fair value you have to take we will incorporate what the probability of the payment occurring next acquisition cost 
so this cost are excluded from the calculation of purchase consideration you should not add this with your purchase consideration if you are having this okay these are known as acquisition cost that means when you are definitely when you have to acquire a subsidiary there are some costs that you will be incurring you don't have to take it in the purchase consideration they're excluded what are those costs legal and professional fees okay so if there are any legal and professional fees that are expensed to profit and loss okay debt or equity issue cost if it's a debt or equity issue cost this will be dealt under ifrs 9 okay you are not going to add this with purchase consideration and show okay this is the amount of no next replacement share based payment skips yes sometimes your consideration might be in this form then how do you account for the consideration consideration transferred in exchange for the control of a subsidiary could include this also okay if you have this you should include this in your purchase consideration okay replacement share based payment scheme uh, exchange for share based payment scheme held by the subsidiary's employees let us understand this a bit more if the acquirer is obliged to issue okay replacement share based payments to employees of the subsidiary in exchange for their existing schemes then the fair value of the replacement scheme must be allocated between if they have an obligation to do that to issue what replacement share based to employees of the subsidiary in exchange for the existing schemes then the fair value of the replacement scheme must be allocated between these two things you have to know how much it, it is for the purchase consideration and how much you should allocate between the post accusation remuneration expense okay so we'll definitely have a question on each of this if it's cash if it's contingent liability if it's a replacement share based payment scheme we'll have a question on this so you don't have to worry about it if you're not understanding this at one go definitely with questions we'll understand this better so the amount allocated as a purchase consideration cannot exceed the value of the original share scheme at the date of acquisition whatever the purchase consideration please remember this it cannot be more than the value of the original share scheme at the date of acquisition the amount attributable to the post accusation services recognized in accordance with ifrs2 post accusation that means after accusation if there is any cost okay or service post accusation service means after accusation if there's any service it will be recognized in accordance with ifrs2 okay that you are not going to take into purchase consideration so we definitely have a nice a beautiful question test understanding to see to calculate purchase consideration in all this criteria cash then we have contingent liability then we have share based payment scheme all those things goodwill and nci there's a close connection between these two okay we can calculate nci using two methods and it will have an impact on the goodwill also okay so either you can measure your nci known as proportionate share of net asset that means you are taking the proportion of the net nci let's say nci is 20 percent so 20 percent of the net asset of the subsidiary the other one is fair value is given fair value of the nci is given okay then so the formula here is given to you nci percentage into the fair value of the net assets of the subsidiary and or the fair value of the nci is given to you question in the question this is normally given method two okay method one you have to find out it's easy because since a percentage you know fair value also you know so just multiply it and find the nci okay but what you have to know is how it will have an impact on the goodwill that's the most interesting part if nci is measured using the first method that means proportionate share then it is known as partial goodwill that means only the acquires goodwill will be calculated the parents goodwill is there ncs goodwill is not there but if the nca is valued at fair value then that goodwill is attributable to both 
parent as well as the NCI. This is known as full goodwill method. Okay. So normally they will tell you, they will always tell you which method to use NCI so you don't have to get confused. This or that, how will I know? Okay. But it can happen that let's say in a question, a parent might acquire two subsidiaries. One subsidiary might be measuring at fair value, the other one might be at a proportionate share. Right? It is possible. Right? So that's why you should know both the methods of calculating NCI because it will have an impact on the goodwill. And this is also an area which is always often asked in the exam that what is the impact of the goodwill if you change the measurement of the NCI method. Bargain purchase. What is bargain purchase? It is known as negative goodwill. Okay, here, the net asset that you have acquired, it is more than your consideration transferred, which is good for you. That means you have saved on your cost. Okay, the value of your net asset is more than what you have actually given to buy that subsidiary, which is good. You have saved some cash, so it's a negative goodwill. Then it's a gain. It is known as a gain for you. Gain on the bargain purchase. You are bargaining and then you're reducing the price, the purchase consideration. So it's a gain for you, right? It's like you are asking for a discount and reducing the price. So that discount is a gain for you. Same like this. So this arises on accusation, the accounting treatment, how, how you have to deal with this. They say negative goodwill is rare, right? Even in your exam also, very rarely you will see negative goodwill. Mostly it is the way normally you calculate goodwill, calculate impairment if it is asked for like that. But if it's a negative goodwill, then and they may suggest that errors were made when determining the value of the consideration transferred and net assets acquired. Okay. And they may suggest because negative goodwill can happen sometimes because of errors also. For example, you might have uh, calculated the value of consideration that is transferred incorrectly or the net assets acquired incorrectly. So this figure should be reviewed for accuracy. You have to review this figure. The value of consideration as well as the net assets but what if there is no error made what if it's genuinely a, it's a negative goodwill if no errors have been made negative goodwill is immediately it is credited immediately to profit and loss it's a gain so it's credited okay it's an income negative good it's a gain if no errors has been made but remember in the exam also let's say you are getting a negative goodwill it's very rare first your first priority should be you have to check all your other figures whether it's correct or not because sometimes it happens that due to incorrect numbers consideration or net assets you are getting that negative goodwill but in fact it is a positive it's an error that you can make if you can you are seeing that there is no error then that negative goodwill you credit to pnl okay measurement period So during the measurement period, IFRS 3 acquires the acquire in a business combination to retrospectively adjust the provisional amounts recognized at the acquisition date to reflect the new information obtained about facts and circumstances that existed as of the acquisition date. What does this mean? This is very important. This often you will encounter in your exam also. Okay. For example, you might have got some new information, right? Some new facts or circumstances might have changed. Now you have to go back and change the figure that you have initially recognized it. Because earlier you didn't have that uh, information and all. IFRS 3 says that. Okay. That you have to retrospectively go and adjust. Retrospectively means go back and change whatever the amounts you have recognized at the accusation date okay if there is any information later on because it is considered that they exist as of at the accusation date even if it's after the accusation date okay it will be considered that at the accusation date only you know all these facts so you will go back and adjust it okay 
some example they have given here so this would result in goodwill arising and accusation being recalculated yes this is a very common area that goodwill you have calculated using some figure later you came to know it's not correct again you have to go back and change that goodwill that was that's what ifrs 3 says you have to recalculate that goodwill okay and the measurement period ends no later than 12 months after the acquisition date measurement period should not be more than 12 months from your accusation date it should be within that 12 months only now let us go through an example to understand this better p bought 100 percent of shares on s on 31st december 2001 for 60000 okay because 100 percent it's a subsidiary and for 60000 this is your purchase consideration on the acquisition date it was estimated that the fair value of the s net asset were 40000 for the year under 31st december 2001 p would consolidate s net assets of 40000 and would also show goodwill of 20,000 because 60 minus 40. Okay, they didn't give you any NCI, so you don't have to worry about NCI now. However, P you cannot have an NCI because you have acquired 100%. You can only have NCI when it's less than 100%. Right? No minority shareholders. Okay. However, P receives further information on 30th June 2002. This is when after 31st December 2001. Okay, from the date of accusation, 12 months. It is within the 12 months, right? six months from the date of accusation which indicate that the fair value of the net asset at the accusation date was actually fifty thousand not forty thousand so now what do you have to do change this retrospectively go back and change it adjust the 40 to 50 because it is within the measurement period measurement period means 12 months from the date of accusation Therefore, the financial statements for the year under 31st December 2001 will be adjusted. So, P will now consolidate net asset of 50,000. That means it will be 60 minus 50, not 40. So, goodwill will be now 10,000, not 20,000. It will reduce. So, that's it. Okay, next, as you can see, it's impairment of goodwill. I will cover this in the third part. Now, I'll be doing all the test you understanding. So, let's do that. Test your understanding eight. Okay, here we are going to find the fair value of identifiable net asset. So P purchased sixty percent of shares of S on first of Jan two thousand one. At the acquisition date, S had a share capital of ten thousand and retained earnings of one ninety thousand. This are the subsidiary share capital and retained earnings. You need this to calculate their net assets. The property plan and equipment of S includes a land with the carrying value of ten thousand, fair value of fifty thousand, included within the intangible assets. Is goodwill of 20,000 which arose on the purchase of the trade and assets of a sole trader business. Okay. S has an internally generated brand that is not recognized in accordance with IS 38. Directors of P believe that this brand has a fair value of 150,000. In accordance with IS 37, you'll be always asked some different accounting issues, uh, different standards you need. To solve your group accounting, remember that. Here, if you can see, there are so many standards IS 38, IS 37, IFRS 3. Okay. So, in accordance with this one, financial statements have disclosed the fact that a customer has initiated legal proceeding against them. If the customer wins, which lawyer has advised, is unlikely. That means they lawyers are saying the company P is going to win. Okay. Estimated damages would be. 1 million. The farewell of this contingent liability has been assessed as 100,000 at the acquisition date. The director of P wished to close one of the division of S. They estimate that this will cost 200,000 in redundancy payment. Discuss with calculations. You have to discuss the farewell of their net identifiable assets. Definitely in the exam, main exam, they will not give so much of information to calculate net asset because it's very easy. One line or two line is enough. But definitely, this is to understand how to calculate net assets. So, you can just take it as a preparation, right? So, in the separate financial statements, that means in the S, what would be the net asset? 10,000 of share plus 190 retail earnings. This will be their net asset. Here, you need to calculate because they didn't give you like this separately. What is the net asset? You have to write first find that so in the consolidated the identifiable net assets of the subsidy must be recognized at what fair value at the accusation date 
so they are writing all the properties of assets and all if it is capable of several disposal of arising from legal or contractual rights all those things are not needed when you are writing finding net assets in your exam remember okay so land if you see this is carried in the individual financial statements at 10000 at the cost but when it comes to consolidation you have to recognize it recognize it at fair value which is 50000 so what would be the carrying amount it is increased by 40000 from 10 to 50 what about the goodwill? Goodwill in the subsidiary's own financial statements not recognized. It is not an identifiable asset because it cannot be disposed of separately from the rest of the business. It is their own generated brand. How can you just dispose a brand? Right? You cannot do it individually. So it is not recognized also in the consolidated financial statements because you cannot dispose it separately. So you cannot. You can identify that as an asset. The goodwill that is there in the subject is own financial statement that you cannot recognize but goodwill that you have calculated on consolidation that definitely you have to recognize okay whatever the brand brand is unrecognized in the individual financial statements but they must be recognized in the consolidated because you are buying it from the subsidiary at its fair value of 150,000 whatever the contingent liability in the contingent liability in the individual financial statements normally it is disclosed but in the consolidated this must be recognized at its fair value of 100,000 okay so because this is a liability what happens it will reduce the total fair value of the identifiable net assets liabilities always reduce the net assets assets always increase the net assets now so no adjustment is made to the fair value of the net assets for the estimated redundancy provision why this is because no obligation exists as at the accusation date so you don't have to make any adjustments for it let us again go through redundancy provision once more. They wish to close one of the they wish to close one of this one. So their wish is not something which is obligation at a cost of this one. So this is something that they are going to do it in the future. No obligating event is there in the past. So no obligation exists. That means you don't have to go back and change it. No adjustment has to be done. So now how are you going to calculate the net as a share capital 10,000 return is 190,000 uplift how much it has increased not 50 not 10 it has increased from 10 by 40,000 so that uplift your writing goodwill 20,000 you have to minus brand 150,000 you have to add and continual liability 100,000 you have to deduct okay what about goodwill that 20,000 let me just check the goodwill yes this goodwill okay you're not recognizing it so you're deducting it and you finally you are getting the net asset of S. Okay. Now let us go to the next one. Test understanding 9. Here we are working on the purchase consideration. So this is falling from the understanding 8 only. Purchase consideration by P in exchange for the shares in S was at this. Cash paid 300,000. Cash to be paid in one year's time 200,000. 10,000 shares in P. They had a nominal value of 1 and fair value at 3 each. 250,000 to be paid in one year's time if S makes a profit before tax of more than 2 million. So it's it's on a condition. And there's a 50% chance of this happening. Fair value of this contingent consider can be measured at the present value of the expected value. Next. P is acquired, required to replace a share-based payment scheme previously granted to S to his employees. By the accusation date, SS employees had rendered their required service for the award but had not exercised the option. The fair value of the SS award at the accusation date was 400,000. Fair value of the peace replacement award, which has no post accusation resting condition attached, was 500,000. Legal fees 10,000. Discount rate 10% is used when required. Why, why, why are they saying when required? Because sometimes you have to find the present value in some condition. There you need to use this discount rate. Okay, so let's start. That means whatever you are taking as purchase consideration, you are adding whatever you are taking as an expense, you are separating it out. Okay, and purchase consideration should be at fair value at the accusation date. So cash, there is no issue. Cash as it is, we can take. But other issue, other things, it is a bit complex. You need to do a working there. If it's a deferred 
cash that means you're going to pay in one year's time you have to discount it to today's value right and this is also included in the goodwill calculation also right how normally we take purchase consideration even deferred cash is also taken in the calculation of the goodwill so how are you going to discount 10 percent is given so one divided by 1.1 because it's 10 percent and to the power of one because in one year's time okay the 200,000 the second one this 200,000 year discounting at 10 percent 300,000 as it is you can take so because it's a deferred cash in one year's time it's a liability okay a liability should be recorded for this amount still you didn't pay the cash as a liability that you have to pay you have an obligation to pay it okay so this is the amount with 300,000 that you have to add coming to the next one where the consideration is share this sh you should measure at fair value so it will be 10,000 not into 1 into 3 at the accusation date how are you going to write the entries share capital will increase so credit entries share capital and share premium 20,000 why share premium because this is 30,000 out of this 30,000 10,000 is share capital why 10,000 if you see here 1 is at nominal 3 is this one so the balance is 2 is share premium 20,000 okay what about the next contingent consideration this also should be measured at fair value in fact everything should be measured at fair value how are you going to measure this at fair value you need to discount it remember so this 250,000 there's a 50% that you will meet the condition and you have to discount again in one year's time so again same 1 divided by 1.1 and this will be your contingent consideration okay So this fair value will incorporate the probability of the payment that is 50% and the time value of the money that is this that's why you have to multiply this two probability as well as the time value of money and you have to make a corresponding entry to the provision you have to recognize a provision for this right next fair value of replacement share based payment scheme this should be allocated between two things one is the purchase consideration the other one is the post acquisition expense okay so if you see here the fair value of the s awarded the acquisition rate was 400,000 and the fair value of the piece replacement award which has no post acquisition investing condition attached 500,000 so 400,000 will be taken as a purchase consideration because this is the fair value of the original scheme at the acquisition date okay it will go okay we'll just go again fair value of the assets award at the accusation date yes next what about the remaining hundred thousand from the 500 this is recognized as an expense okay profit and loss in the consolidated statement of profit and loss as a post accusation expense because there is no vesting conditions to satisfy okay because they told which has no post accusation vesting conditions attached What about the legal fees expensed to provide and loss? So what is the total fair value of the consideration now? 300 of the cash as it is, deferred cash, you have found the present value, shares, you have got 30,000, contingent consideration you have calculated above and only the 400,000, not the 100,000, it will go as an expense. Okay, so this is the fair value of the consideration. Now let us go to the last test understanding. Test understanding 10, the goodwill. So the fair value of the NCI at accusation date is 160 and calculate goodwill arising in the case accusation using both the methods of NCI. Okay. So this should be something easy. Whenever they're asking you to find the both methods, usually they will not say like this. Right? They might give you or they might tell you what would be the impact and all. But sometimes to support an answer, you might need to calculate. As a main answer, they uh, requirement they rarely ask this type of easy questions because it's very easy but you to support in order to support something you might need to do this okay then do it together like this in a column of format you can make two columns one for fair value one for net asset it's very quick so consideration will be same for both and in working nine test understanding nine we have just got the consideration nci what is the nci 40 percent because we have bought 60 percent right of 270,000 
because NCA the fair value is 270,000. So according to that, it will be 108,000 for net asset. But fair value is a, they have already given you. NCA is 160,000. If you see here, this 160,000, you see, it's already given. Net assets at accusation also will be same, 270, 270. You have already calculated in test understanding 8. So this will be your goodwill. You can see that your goodwill is higher under the fair value method. Okay. So because fair, why it is higher? Because the fair value calculates the group's goodwill as well as the goodwill for the NCI. But the proportionate, the goodwill which they have, it is only for the group, not for the NCI. That's why it's lower. Okay. So that's it for part two. And part three will be covering the rest of it. We'll be summarizing. And we'll be discussing specially impairment of goodwill. That is relating to the business combination. So see you in part three.